So today I'm going to teach you everything I know about main stage and CPU management in one single video. So why should you care about CPU management? I mean, it doesn't sound very exciting, does it? I mean, main stage and software keystrokes are amazing, but they do have this one fundamental problem, and that's that you can ask the computer to do way more than it should do and basically end up. <laughs> So in this video, I'm going to try and teach you everything you need to know to try and stop that happening. You don't have to do all these tips, but I'm going to be pretty comprehensive here and start right at beginner level. And by the end of the video, I'm going to show you some really advanced stuff you can do as well. So here we go. Part one, preparation. Join me on the desktop of my computer. I'm going to teach you a load of things here that you should do just before you even open the program, because there's actually a lot of things that can really derail main stage from outside the program. So come up here and turn off Wi-Fi or just make sure the Wi-Fi is turned off. Yep, we're all good. And then turn off Bluetooth 2, and then put it on Do Not Disturb so you don't get any notifications pop up on the screen while you're playing or anything of this nature. Also turn off AirDrop if you've got that as well on. The other thing you want to do then is make sure that all the programs you've got are closed apart from main stage. So a good way to do this is perhaps go to Activity Monitor, I think it's called and go to memory and just see what's using a lot of memory. I mean, you can look down the bottom of the screen as well, but you can see here that Google Chrome and WhatsApp are using a fair bit. So let's close those out. I'm also gonna close out Microsoft Auto Update and Activity Monitor. I mean, who actually updates Microsoft Word? So looks like we're all good now. So I'm gonna go back into search now and I'm gonna look for system preferences. And I'm gonna find battery. And I'm basically going to try and make sure that display never goes to sleep. The reason I do this is because this actually did cause me a problem once. I was once playing and the display went to sleep and my computer lost all of the MIDI connections to the keyboard and everything like that. And it was frustrating, of course. So this is just one I really like to do personally. Though actually you might find you can get away with not doing this, but it's more just a personal thing. So I'm also making sure that it's both going to do this when it's connected to the power adapter and when it's just running on the battery itself. So here's another little tip as well. Main stage can actually run in a higher res or low res mode depending on whether you've got a Retina Mac or not. So if you go to the applications folder and click on get info on the main stage application, you can press open in low resolution. And this will actually use less resources, less CPU. And to be honest, you don't really notice the difference when you're playing live or when you're using the application. Also, it sounds a little bit obvious, but make sure you've got your MacBook plugged into the charger because MainStage will drain your resources a bit harder than a lot of programs. Part two, inside MainStage. So now we've done all the kind of preliminary stuff, let's hop into the application and actually do some stuff inside. So I've just opened up this really pretty basic concept with just two patches and I've hopped into the main settings. I'm gonna go into general. And I'm going to make sure that auto save modified concerts is set to never. I've got it set that way because I've used the program quite a bit, but it will normally default to every five or 10 minutes or something like this. And this is really important to have on never because you don't want mainstage trying to save itself halfway through a live performance because this will cause a CPU spike, which might cause the program to crash. Now head into the advanced settings and we're going to play with the input output buffer size settings. The bigger the number, in simple terms, the more time you give the computer to do processing, so the more latency you'll have, but the safer it is to run. You can also adjust the driver latency between more safety and less set latency as well in a similar manner, but make sure you've set CPU usage to maximum number of cores, as if you've got a multi-core processor, you want to take advantage of this. So the next top tip is to use the CPU load history. So come up here and click on CPU. And you can see as I play that the CPU is working a little bit. I should say I'm using an M1 Mac, so the CPU is not going to have to work too hard. But on my older computer, the spikes would be a lot bigger. So if I duplicate this, you can see we've had a little CPU spike. And generally speaking, the CPU is a bit higher. Also, if I create another copy of Valhalla Shimmer, you see the CPU goes a bit more. But we're still barely working the computer at all. That was just a bit of a quick demonstration, but the buffer size settings I've just shown you are really, really unique to your particular computer. So just have a play around with them and try and find the best. I'm now going to show you another common mistake that people sometimes do, and that is to not simplify their concerts. So I've just loaded in a load of pads I made from this collection. I know, shameless plug. So I'm not going to be using all these sounds for a set, for example. So let's delete some of them. 
So I'm going to press Command A to select them all and then just unselect the ones I'm not going to delete, just as a demonstration. So if I press Backspace, that'll delete them all and you can see MainStage remove, is removing them from the set list. So now I'm just left with the ones I want and MainStage will run pretty quickly now, comparatively speaking. This is really quite important to do if you've got a bit of an older Mac. Now I'm going to talk about another top tip for saving CPU, and that is to use aliases. But before we talk about aliases, I'll talk about what happens when you just copy a patch normally. So I've just picked this sound that I quite like, and say oh, I like that sound a lot, so I want to use it. And I've just called it synth, and I've copied it, and I put it in the first patch as well. And you can see it plays fine with the ethereal pad thing we've got going on in the background. And I can copy it here as well. And I've just copied all those. I've not pasted them as an alias. And if I put an effect on any one of them, then it will be unique. So the other ones won't have received this effect. So you can see that if we go back to the first one, we don't have the delay that I've added to the one on the second patch. So that's all fine. But say I don't care about the delay and actually they can all just be the same on every song. Well, if I press, if I press option command V, then I'll paste as an alias rather than just pasting normally. And you can see this because there's a little green arrow on the top of the channel strip, which I've just highlighted. So now if I add an effect like a reverb to this channel strip, then it will actually appear on every instance of the every alias of that channel strip essentially. So we'll just demonstrate that in a second. So I've just turned off the mod wheel and we've got the reverb on this synth sound. And you can see if we go back to the first patch, we've got exactly the same. So they're all connected. And then we can paste again as an alias and they will be connected. And the advantage of this is it just uses less resources because it's effectively like only having one instance in terms of memory. Next tip is to use perform mode. This really optimizes main stage for performance, both visually and also in terms of CPU. So it's generally the best to try and operate in this mode, I find. The only caveat I would say is sometimes in edit mode, it's a bit easier to see if something's going wrong. But for the most part, I like to use perform mode. I'm going to head back to layout now and we're going to add a CPU meter to our concept. So I've just created a text box and surprisingly I'm going to stick the word CPU in that box. Now I'm going to create a parameter text and I'm going to put that underneath the word CPU. And this is going to be an indicator that tells us how hard the computer's working. Come down here and set text labels display to value and then we should be in business. Then we need to click on it at concert level, I should add, and we're going to map the CPU load to be the parameter. And so now when we're in perform mode playing, we have an indicator of how hard the CPU is working. This is pretty useful because it means we can diagnose if anything's going wrong. But as you can see here, we're doing pretty well because the CPU is barely trying and we're recording video as well at the same time. So things looking good. Another really useful tip is to use buses. So if you've got an effect and you want to use it lots and lots of times, it can be a really good idea to do this. So if we go back to the concert level and we click on the plus, then click on aux and press create one channel. Just press create, ignore that little message. And as you can see, we've created this new auxiliary bus, which we're going to put in a reverb effect on. Let's put Valhalla Shimmer on it. And let's just make a really big reverb just so it's really noticeable when we go back to test it later. We also need to route or route the bus depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from. So let's go to here and go to bus and we'll put it through number eight, shall we? Let's also change the name as well to something that we can then quickly identify when we go back to the patch right now. So let's go to the patch, uh, just play a bit, it's working. So now go to send and put it through bus 8. And you can hear it's working. This is really, really useful thing to do because, for example, if you wanted to use Valhalla Shimmer lots and lots of times on all your patches, 
then every time you create an instance of it, it's going to use more CPU. Whereas if you just create one instance at constant level, then you're all good. So as an example of this, we can also put it on the pad. And we've got Shimmer on both of them now. And more Shimmer is always good. Probably, I don't know. Wow, you made it to part three. Plugins and extra tips. So this section just focuses on some of the sounds inside main stage and their different CPU properties, and also some of the third party stuff and how you might fare with this. Whenever you open a new main stage concert, you're always faced with these reverb buses that you get at the concert level. They all use this plugin called Space Designer, which can be a bit CPU intensive. So I generally tend to try and avoid it, so the first thing I always do when I open up a new main stage concert is to delete the four buses it gives you with Space Designer on them. And I'll create my own auxiliary bus, as I showed you before, and I will just stick on it a reverb. Make sure to route it or route it first. So that's good. I've got the signal coming through. And I'm going to just put on a very basic reverb. Silver verb, mono to stereo. This is a really, really great reverb. Make sure you turn the wet all the way up to 100% and don't have any dry signal going through. This reverb I tend to find is really, really versatile. You can obtain some really good results with it. Another plugin I try to avoid using is Delay Designer. A bit like Space Designer, but for reverb, this plugin uses a bit more resources than the other delay options. This is the nature of these plugins though. The ones that are more, should we say, flexible tend to be a bit more demanding. So I tend to use Stereo Delay or Tape Delay if possible. As far as synths go, the best but also the most intensive CPU-wise synth main stage has is Alchemy. You can achieve some really great results with this synth, but many of the presets can be a bit CPU intensive on particularly older machines, as I say. So this is one I tend to try and avoid if I was designing a patch for, should we say, general use. So I'll now talk about the synths I really like to use in main stage in terms of CPU. ES2 is the kind of foundational main stage synth. It sounds pretty good. I mean, it doesn't quite compare to like Serum or Alchemy that I've just shown you, but the sound quality is pretty good and you can get some pretty versatile, great sounding results with it. If you want a bit more vintage sound, then use Retro Synth. This is also really low CPU. It sounds great and I use it really regularly. Now let's talk about third party. Now, this is a, such a varied topic, but I've just got Serum up here, which is a really popular third-party synth, but it's also notorious for being quite high CPU in certain cases. So it's not something I'd really use with main stage too much. But as you can see, if I turn all the effects on, you start to get a bit more, a bit of higher CPU, shall we say. And I'm not even playing that many notes. So I guess what I'd say is, even with main stage stock stuff, you're gonna have to think a bit about what you're doing. And so the more third-party stuff you throw into the mix, the more you're going to have to be careful with CPU because these different plugins do behave quite differently. This is the stock main stage sampler. Generally speaking, sampled synths don't use a lot of CPU. They just tend to use a bit more memory. But I'm just demonstrating here, just scanning through the patches and you can see they use almost no CPU whatsoever. And they all use pretty roughly the same kind of CPU as well. As a final demonstration of the third party aspect, here's another synth from gospel musicians called Pure Synth Platinum 2. It's a really, really great synth, but you can see here from some of the presets, I'm getting a bit more CPU spikes. Nothing too crazy, but just more into the kind of 30s, 40s, nearly. And you can see it's different for different patches as well. Now I'm gonna show you an advanced tip that I detail quite thoroughly in this video. If you really like a sound from Serum or Omnisphere, but you find the CPUs unmanageable, then you can always sample it using this technique. So I'm going into Utility and I'm going to load up Auto Sampler. Now this is just a MIDI based plugin that's going to send MIDI trigger notes to the VST such that we can sample it. So first thing we need to do is just drag out the range in which we're going to sample over. So I'm just dragging the range appropriate for an 88 key keyboard. You might sometimes find for a sound you're sampling that it doesn't sound particularly good on certain parts of the keyboard. So it's generally a good idea to try and make sure you've sampled a range where it, the patch sounds quite good. But for this tutorial, I'm just going to sample the whole range. I'm going to sample every six semitones because this will be fine for this kind of synth sound. If you were using a piano, you'd probably want to turn it down to three semitones. I'm not going to take multiple samples for each key by doing a round robin. And I'm going to reduce the sustain length to about eight seconds. 
I'm then going to use, I think I'll just pick Penrose machine for this one. You can try the different algorithms out, but this one should be fine for this particular sound. This is just searching for where it's going to loop the samples such that they sustain out. Now all we need to do is press sample and tell the computer where we want to put our new sampler instrument. I'll just call this one demo. So let's hit sample. This normally takes a few minutes, so I've just sped things up. So now I'm going to create a new channel strip and I'm going to create a new instance of the EXS24 sampler and load in the sampler instrument. So you can hear it sounds pretty good actually. It sounds pretty close to Serum. And if you look at the light blue EXS24 in the CPU load history, you can see it's been very kind to the CPU. This is because playing back samples is not very CPU intensive compared to a modeling synth like Serum. To really prove this point, I'll now just play a load of notes. So let's try out the auto sampled version. So I know that sounded beautiful, but it was really just to prove a point that actually if you use this technique, you can use some sounds that you might not have thought possible to use live. This leads us on to our next tip. Sometimes the best CPU management is to know when you're beaten. Many songs have so many parts now that you have to make big compromises on sound quality so that you can kind of recreate all the parts live. And even then, the parts you've kind of created are a bit of a not so good imitation. So. If in doubt and you're feeling lazy and sampling's not your thing, just leave it on the track. Take the song Let Go by Hillsong Young and Free. So for this track, I'd say there's two core sounds, the piano and this polyphonic trance synth. So for the piano, I'm just using addictive keys with a tiny amount of reverb. And for the synth, I've just got this. What I'll do is I'll just use those two sounds live and remove the two stems from the track. So this is what I'm not playing, which is all the background kind of stuff. And the background stuff again. I'm all for trying to play as much live as possible, but I've also learned that it's not possible to compete with the track sometimes for certain songs. I have in the past tried to play more than what I've just demonstrated for songs like Let Go. However, this can be a little bit difficult, not just because you have to play more and think harder, but also because your audio engineer is going to have less control over the overall sound. So lots of things to think about. Before we wrap up though, last tip. This is a bit of a bonus one. So I've just gone back into layout mode and I've created a fader. And I'm going to map that fader to the volume of this electric piano. So let's just check that one out. It's all working nice. You can see the volumes going up and down. So now we're going to set up a plug-in bypass using the fader. So if we press on the plus icon here and we press map parameter, and we click on the like power button for the plugin essentially, then this is going to result in the plugin. Oh, not yet. We need to change the rage minimum to be bypassed. So that means that when the fade is down, the plugin is off, and when the fade is up, the plugin is on. So that means that when your you know fader is down, you're not using any resources, you're not using any CPU. So that can be quite useful if you've got some pretty CPU intensive sounds that you only need to use at a certain point in a song. So you can see when I lower it, the CPU drops for the classical electric piano to zero, the orange contribution on the graph. Also, if you turn up the reverb bus send there, you can see that the reverb carries on when I've turned the fader down. So that pretty much wraps everything up. That was a long video but hopefully somewhat comprehensive and hopefully if you know nothing about main station CPU management, you know quite a bit now. With that being said, have a great day and God bless.